The fat I eat is the fat I wear. The body does the most efficient thing possible with fat. It just moves it. It moves it from the fork and spoon to your abdominal fat stores. From my lips to my hips, the fat I eat is the fat I wear. Why would it do anything else? Hey everybody, this is Klaus from Plant Based News. If you know anything about the doctor featured in the previous clip, Dr. John McDougall, you'll know that he's uh, a pioneer in the plant-based medical space. He's often known for his messaging about the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Recently, however, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, who's best known for being author of the best-selling book, The China Study, and a bit of a, a godfather in the plant-based medical space, has heavily criticized this rhetoric and messaging. Let me know down below what you think, but check out this interview with Dr. T. Colin Campbell's son, Nelson Campbell. I hope you enjoy. Another idea that I hear a lot of uh, in the community today is this phrase, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And of course, uh, when it comes to the consumption of refined oils, I think there's some merit to that idea. But I hear a lot of people uh, advocating against the consumption of whole foods like nuts, seeds, avocados, and coconuts. Um, what, what do you think about that and this notion of the fat you eat is the fat you wear? First of all, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. That's a very superficial comment to make. It doesn't work that way biochemically. We should not be making that statement, first of all. Secondly, the fat we talk about that um, may be problematic is the added oil isolated from the whole food. The food itself like nuts and seeds and so forth and so on, they're kind of rich in, there's a reason for nature putting that in there. It enables them to get a kickstart, you know, when they start growing new, new plants as an aside. But uh, to take, to, to say that the whole food is the problem also is not correct. Uh, in fact, the evidence shows that nuts, a lot of evidence, very convincing evidence, that nuts, if anything, have a benefit. They're rich in vitamin E, for example, that I've known that in the trade for decades. A lot of us in the business have known that. Uh, and to eat nuts, of course, is higher in fat for a specific reason. We don't want to just make up a whole meal just of nuts and seeds, quite frankly. But that's good food. And the evidence shows it's good food. It's that simple. I know that you just did a really deep dive into all of the research out there on nuts, and uh, you were quite impressed by what you saw. And again, you know, we're talking about modest consumption of nuts. So uh, consum consuming nuts as nature would present them to us. So not eating bags of shelled nuts, but maybe it's a handful of walnuts on your oatmeal in the morning or something like that. And, and the evidence all suggests that that's actually heart healthy, according to what you found. Yes. And, and that makes sense when you think about it on an intuitive level, because you always argue that a plant-based diet is optimal because it comes from nature. It's what's natural to us. It's what we evolved on over time. And, um, you know, I always remember being a kid and mom shooing us out of the house and we we were outside uh, most every day, and I, I used to hike and camp and ride horses, and the forests were littered with nuts. You know, I could ride across our farm in Virginia and find three or four different kinds of nuts and would stop and eat and go on to the next thing. And of course, in the tropical regions where humanity spent so much time, there are avocados and coconuts and Somehow I don't, and, uh, I, I don't see our ancestors having walked around with lab equipment measuring the fat content of an avocado. No, Do you? I would say. <laughs> yeah, it, it is part of nature, she said. It's yeah. The, the other thing um, that, that you've mentioned before, and you might want to comment on it here, is that the logic behind this statement, the fat you eat, the fat you wear, is the very same logic that the dairy industry used to promote dairy consumption. Basically what they said is eat these calcium rich foods because the calcium you eat is the calcium that your bones will wear, right? That, that you'll wear in your bones, it's good for your bones. When in reality now we're finding that 
societies that consume high levels of dairy and meat products actually have weaker bones. In fact, their bones are not wearing the calcium. It doesn't work that way. Biology is not so simple. It's not just what you intake. It's how the body utilizes what you consume. I think the best answer for that calcium question, this is evidence that was available back in the 1980s and before, by a friend of mine, by the way. But that evidence, simply if you plot the calcium intake in different societies against the rate of bone fracture, which in turn is related to osteoporosis, the higher the calcium intake, the higher the fracture rate, just to go along with what you just said. More calcium, excessive calcium in that particular form causes health problems, not solutions. Right, so just, just eating more calcium-rich foods like milk and cheese that was, doesn't ensure that your body's going to retain that calcium. That was a good sign, of, a good example of reduction in my weather, mm -hmm. given special value just to that one element, calcium. Of course, mm -hmm. calcium is really important. Mm -hmm. But it's being used to sell a food product. Yeah. So when, when you hear that the fat you eat is the fat you wear, you're hearing uh, kind of a reductionist thought because oh, it's, yeah. not, it's not taking into account what happens after you eat the avocado or the nut or the seed. It gives no right. um, consideration to, to what happens in your body and how it's utilized. It's a superficial comment from one point of view, and that is that we're thinking that that's just all fats the same. It's not. Yeah. You know, so, leave that out. so another category of, of ideas circulating in the community is this notion of, of eating certain foods because somehow a certain plant foods are better than other plant foods. And, um, you know, I've heard, for example, the, the advice to, to over-consume, really, uh, greens and having multiple servings of greens a day because, you know, maybe it promotes, uh, I guess, production of nitric oxide and, and uh, helps with endothelial function, maybe somehow prevents heart disease. But in reality, uh, heart disease is an incredibly complex process that occurs over time. So it doesn't make sense to seize on one sliver of that process and then look at a food that may affect that one sliver and then advocate for the overconsumption of that food. Is that something yeah, that makes sense? It is. It's, it's not appropriate. It's simply not appropriate to focus on one mechanism. It can be used for discussion to illustrate how things work, but it should be left at that. Uh, one mechanism being uh, used to describe a whole condition, that's inappropriate because what happens if we take that approach there's somebody wants to come along and find a chemical to, let's say, enhance it or block it. Or a food. Or, yeah. Another idea kind of a, uh, in this category is this notion of nutrient density. You know, the idea that some foods are more, quote, nutrient dense than other foods and therefore should be uh, consumed in greater quantities. And of course, if we accept that line of thinking, maybe we shouldn't be even be eating the lowly potato. Right? I mean, uh, what, what do you think about this idea of nutrient density? I've been involved with that concept since I was in graduate school, but the, the concept of nutrient density has been really seriously distorted. First off, in order to determine how much, how nutrient dense, let's say, a food is, you have to know which, how much of different nutrients are in there in theory. You have to decide on how much value to give to individual nutrients. So it's all a con constructed bunch of nonsense, actually. Uh, I can remember the day when milk was the most nutrient-dense food of all. Now today, it's something different. Maybe spinach or kale or something like that. No, nutri that nutrient density concept should be stricken from our language. It really has nothing to do with the scientific evidence that we have. And there may be some foods like the lowly potato that maybe it's not as, quote, nutrient dense, but it's still important, right? Well, the, the potato, I can make another comment on that one there too, is a great source of energy. But interestingly, also, that potato alone, or potatoes alone, have enough protein, by the way. Mm -hmm. Has enough protein. We don't need any more protein from other sources like animals. Yeah. And there's value to just starch. There's value to, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, 
There are many of these kinds of ideas, and I just wanted to discuss a few of them uh, as examples of the kind of reductionist thinking that I know has bothered you that's emerging in the very community that you helped to spawn. So this, this brings us to the really key point of our discussion here, and this is what you always say, and I love it when you say this, which is that it's really simple. There's no need to obsess about all these details. Just focus on eating all the different parts of the plant. Make sure you get plenty of color in your diet. And it's okay to use a little bit of salt and sugar to flavor your food so that you can enjoy it, so that you can derive pleasure from it. And it's as simple as that.